This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, good afternoon, however or wherever you may be watching this. We welcome you to First Presbyterian Church. This is our online worship service. We are now back at home because of the COVID-19 restrictions that are in place. Also because of a, a sense of being cautious, we're trying to worship at home and avoid uh, being in public worship. The session will keep you informed and uh, through email and through other means, but in the meantime, uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy the worship of God and God's presence in your life. Today is Christ the King Sunday in the life of the church. We celebrate that Christ is King over everything. Christ isn't simply King on Sunday mornings, but Christ is King of everything. Friends in Christ, let us prepare our hearts and minds today to worship a holy God, and be glad in it. Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. We welcome one and all of you this morning. A special welcome if you're joining us as our guest today. The announcements are in the inside front cover if you'd like to follow along. The flowers up here, the red and white flowers, are in memory of Ron Peters. His service was uh, earlier this week, and we thank you for participating in that service of worship. Today is Covenant Sunday, a day we normally bring forward our covenant cards or commitment cards. We're not going to ask you to do that. Um, we're going to ask you to put them in the offering plate as you leave today. If you have forgotten yours, there are some yellow ones uh, towards the back of the sanctuary. You're more than welcome to use those. We're just trying to plan ahead for 2021 and to celebrate our commitment to Christ in that way. Friends in Christ, let us prepare our hearts and minds today to worship a holy God. We come for God gathers us here, with that community called faith, where the hungry are served first, where the thirsty drink life's water. We come for God welcomes us here, in, into that home called grace, where the naked are clothed in robes of hope, where the stranger is embraced with the long, as the long lost prodigal. We come for God unites us here, sisters and brothers in that family called love, where the imprisoned model justice, where the sick are cradled in God's peace. God, Father of the poor, your son Jesus was born among us, poor, humble, independent. Open our eyes and our hearts and our hands to honor him now as our Lord and King by welcoming him in those who are hungry and thirsty and who, all who are in, abandoned and lonely. In refugees, in the poor and the sick, 
Let our love become free and spontaneous. Like the tenderness you have shown us in your Son, welcome us to the everlasting kingdom prepared for through, for us through God, Christ Jesus and our Lord. Amen. are the promises stretching back into the recesses of time, yet as new as this very moment. When we lose our way, God searches for us until we are found. When we hurt others, God brings healing to all. When we sin, God forgives us. Let us hold these promises close to our hearts as we confess those things we try to hide. Holy God, we stock the food pantries, but brush aside those who hunger for a friendship. We give our hand-me-downs away, but overlook those whose hopes have been stripped away. We glad hand those just like us, but turn a deaf ear to our neighbors who talk funny. Forgive us, hope of the ages. You persistently search for us in the side streets of the, streets of the world, gathering us up and bringing us home so we may be drenched in the waters of your bottomless pool of forgiveness, watched over by your child, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God searches for the lost and finds us. God invites the hungry to the table and feeds us. God sends Jesus and frees us from death's prison. God forgives all who sin and heals us with mercy and grace. In Jesus Christ, we have been forgiven. Thanks be to God.
lesson is from the book of Ezekiel. The passage dwells on the nurturing, protecting role of the shepherd king. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among the scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the watercourses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted all, all at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide, I will save my flock and they shall no longer be ravaged and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them, and I, the Lord, have spoken. The word of the Lord. Good morning, kids. Good afternoon. Uh, whatever time you're watching this video, there's one word in today's Bible lesson that I want you to know. It's the word that you've heard before, and it's a word that your parents have taught you to practice, and it's a word that you've seen maybe before. It's the word share. Like, I'm supposed to share with my brother or sister. I'm supposed to share with my friends, I'm supposed to share with everyone. And today, the Bible doesn't mention this, but it suggests it in the text. There's a Bible lesson that the big kids are going to hear. Well, you'll hear it as well. And it, it says, I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you visited me. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. Basically what it means is that we share with God's people who are in need. We share our dollars. We share our money with them. We share our time with them. We share a lot of other things with them. And I want you to remember that as you go through life, sharing doesn't end when you're in elementary or middle school or high school. Sharing happens all throughout our lives. And God's people in particular, we are called to share with others. The lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew. I'm reading from chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. Um, in most of our Bibles, this is uh, subtitled, The Judgment of the Nations. Listen for the word of the Lord. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison. I was in prison, and... Uh, 
and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these, you are members of my family, and you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Holy God, having heard your word faithfully read, might it also be faithfully proclaimed. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Together we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. The Reverend Joe Ledwell died just a few years ago. Joe served as a longtime pastor at a Presbyterian church in the Chicago area. Most people didn't know the Reverend Joe Ledwell very well until an article was written in the Chicago Tribune profiling a ministry that he once had. That ministry that he once had was a ministry to the forgotten. In Cook County, Illinois, there are about a dozen or more unclaimed bodies that die every month. Joe said at, so, at one point, uh, a low number would have been about 12, a high number would have been 30. And Joe was asked to officiate at the committal service for those unclaimed bodies in Cook County. Because they weren't identified, the pine box would read on the outside, white male number 100872, I'm making that number up, of course. Or another pine box might say, Hispanic female, number 80772. And one by one, the boxes were laid, the coffins were laid, and Joe would do a liturgy or a committal service for the dead. In an article, another article that profiled Joe's commitment to those folk, Joe said, we must not forget the forgotten. I like that phrase because it reminds me of the phrase in the text today, the least of these. Joe's ministry was an unsung ministry. No one knew about it until the Chicago Tribune profiled him back in 2002. Today we continue in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 25. It's the third parable in a series of parables regarding the second coming of Jesus, when he will return. The first parable is the parable of the ten bridesmaids. What do you do when you wait? How do you wait? How do you prepare for when you, when you wait? And are you prepared when the bridegroom comes? The second parable we looked at last week was this parable of the talents or what you do with the resources, the talent that God gifts to us. Do we multiply it, <clears throat> excuse me, to advance the kingdom of God? Or do we just simply bury the talents that we have and give them to God when we pass? Of course, that's not what the parable is asking us to do. The parable is insinuating that we multiply 
the gifts that God has given us for the kingdom of God. Today we look at an interesting parable. It's a comparison of the time when Jesus will come. It's, it's the judgment. Some people call it the judgment of the nations. And when Jesus returns, all the nations will be there and he will begin to separate. In fact, let's go to the text. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And you begin to wonder, well, how did they inherit the kingdom? Well, the text tells us, I was sick, I was, excuse me, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Notice the surprise in the text next. Then the righteous will answer, well, Lord, when did we do that? When was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked or gave you clothing? Notice what the king says. The king answered them, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. There's that expression in the text, the least of these. Joe Ledwell would say it's the forgotten folk. There's a counterpoint in the text. The counterpoint in the text is when this division is happening, the righteous are there, the unrighteous are also there. And they're addressed at the latter part of the parable. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. The counterpoint is just the opposite. I was sick and you did not visit me. I was a stranger. You did not welcome me. I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. But notice at the end of the text, they're surprised as well. Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And he says it again. Truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And then. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. When Jesus returns in Matthew 25, he's not talking about right doctrine. He's talking about how you treated the forgotten of our society. Now, don't get me wrong. Doctrine matters. We're a creedal church. We believe that what the saints before us said matters to us. And we believe that what people of faith have said about the biblical text matters to us. But in Matthew 25, the focus is on the forgotten. What did you do in your lifetime to help them? What did you do in your lifetime to support those who Jesus calls them the least of these? That's the focus of this parable. And there's a separation at the end of time, Jesus says. And we're called to help out. There's an interesting thing, thing that's happening in American Christianity today. It's a, it's a rather good thing. Years ago, the least of these were ministered to, and I'm, I'm making a generalization now, and some people might not agree with me. But the least of these were helped by the Roman Catholic Church and the mainline churches. They had social ministries, social witness ministries, and if there were food banks or hospitals, many of them were Roman Catholic or other mainline traditions. Now, I realize that's a generalized statement, and some people may not agree with me, including my Baptist friends. But what has happened in American Christianity is that more and more people are understanding and recognizing Matthew 25 that our lives are shaped by how we support those who are most vulnerable in our society. 
the leader of that movement, he wouldn't call himself a leader of that movement, was the, the Reverend Jim Wallace. Jim wrote a book years ago called God's Politics. Back when he was a seminary student in Trinity Seminary in Deerfield, Illinois, he wondered how many times in Scripture are the poor referenced or the stranger or the sick or the inmates. And what he did was he took a Bible and they cut out all of the Scripture references to the poor, the disenfranchised, the sick. And his whole, excuse me, his Bible has all kinds of holes in it. He and his friends discovered that one out of every 16 verses in the entire Bible, including the Old Testament, have a reference to those people groups, the poor, the disenfranchised, the sick, the hungry. In fact, he argues that in the Synoptic Gospels, it's even more than that. To this day, when Jim Wallace speaks at a conference, he'll bring that Bible and he'll hold it up full of holes and he'll say, how are you helping the poor and the oppressed? Because you can't take out those parts of the Bible and just read the parts that you like, he says. Today is Christ the King Sunday in the life of the church. Christ the King Sunday is the last Sunday of the liturgical calendar. It's a Sunday where we set aside to honor Christ as King. And it's a Sunday that we remember that Christ is not just King of Sunday mornings or Sunday afternoons. Christ is not King on Wednesday nights when we come for choir or other um, discipleship classes. Christ is King over everything. And do we honor him as Christ is King? And when I read today's text, the best way I see to honor Christ is by how we serve the most vulnerable in our society. We can say we believe that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Christ over everything. But if we continually walk by those who are in need, what does that say about us? What does that say about us? One of the things that we must not forget when we look at this parable is this understanding that this parable also tells us about God. You see, we like to place ourselves, excuse me, place ourselves in the text. We sometimes think, well, we're on the right or the left, or we've helped people in the past. This week, I'm going to ask you to think about God in this text. Because this parable tells us about God. If Christ cares about the poor, it tells us that God is not some distant deity far from us. It tells us that God is ever present in the circumstances of our lives. And especially in the lives of the most vulnerable of our society. God is present at St. Cloud Hospital to the person who's on a ventilator. God is present to the person who's been dismissed from the hospital but is now on oxygen. God is present in the lives of those who are working to end this pandemic and those who are working to serve those who are in need. This parable reminds us that God cares for the poor but it, it's also a great reminder to us that God is present in our circumstances, in our lives. And we should be engaged in the ministry to others just as God is engaged with us. This text also reminds us that we're not to fear the outsider. We're to embrace them as God's people, welcoming them as they welcome us. You see, Joe Ledwell, his, me his message to us still holds true. We should not forget the forgotten. I know it's not good English, but it helps us as we interpret this passage. May we be God's people as we welcome all 
as we respect the most vulnerable among us, and as we care for all of God's people. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for your word. We ask that we might be faithful ambassadors as we witness to Christ in our midst. We pray that as we journey through this time of stay at home and reflection, that we might care and be concerned about the most vulnerable in our society. Guide us now, not just to reflect, but to act on what we believe to be true. You are king. And so help us to act accordingly. In the name of Jesus, we offer this prayer. Amen. I'm back here at the hospital for obvious reasons. The infection rate in Stearns County has skyrocketed since I was last here. And I've been told that uh, this place is in need of prayer. There are a lot of workers who are struggling. There are a lot of patients who are here who may be struggling. And we're praying today for the great physician to come to this place and um, take over. We continue to pray for those who work here and those who serve here. Uh, we especially pray for those uh, who are in COVID units and those who are having breathing problems. Friends in Christ, let us pray. Holy God, for all who have lost their way in life, we cry out to you to make the church welcome them and give them you and your good news to live by. For all those people who are driven from their homes with the many victims of war and civil strife, with all strangers living in foreign lands, we cry out that people may be hospitable to them. We especially remember today those who live in Nigeria and Uganda, Turkey and Azerbaijan with all those who hunger for food, who thirst for justice, who crave for human dignity, we cry out that we may hear your voice in them. With all those who care for the sick and the disabled, with doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and other health care givers, we cry out that we may recognize you and those who need affectionate, loving care. We especially pray for those who work behind me today. We pray for doctors, nurses, and staff here at St. Cloud Hospital. We pray for all those who are isolated or imprisoned because of their convictions, with all those who are persecuted, who are prisoners of their hatred, their greed, of their failings. We ask you to free them. Those voices that cry out to us, the eyes that plead with us, may we recognize you in them, Lord and love you in them. Be near to us, we pray, now and forever. Together we pray in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We invite you to stand for the blessing and benediction. Remember the coins are for the boys, if you don't mind. Receive now the benediction. And now may the blessing and mercy of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be and abide with you always. And God's people say together. Yeah.